I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Today we're in the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and the author is the Apostle Paul. Just to refresh our memories, the church in Corinth was birthed out of a synagogue in Acts chapter 18. And the book that we know as 1 Corinthians was actually Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Paul's first letter was lost. So the title, 1 Corinthians, simply refers to the first letter to the church at Corinth that survived. Paul makes reference to this first letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. He says this, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet, I certainly did not mean with sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are all outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. You know, one of the things that I love about this epistle is how Paul reminds the Corinthian church of both the Great Commission and God's standard of personal holiness for believers. The Great Commission is Jesus' command to go to the nations to preach the gospel and to teach God's Word. And we find that in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Let's look at it now. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Once again, he says amen at the end there. Uh, Once again, that's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. At the same time, as we are going to the nations, personal holiness demands that we live separately from the nations. Now consider John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 14 through 18. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. That's John chapter 17, verses 14 through 18. So how do you go to the world as a change agent while not allowing the world to change you? How do you do that? And you know, how do you live in the freedom of Christ without stumbling those who were formerly in bondage to the object of your newfound freedom? Answering those questions is the main goal of today's chapter. We are learning operational theology from the early church that is still practical today because God's word endures forever. Consider this from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. Since you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, will in love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and the glory of a man as the flower of the grass. And though the grass withers and its flower fails away or falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. Once again, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Now, many pastors teach you what to think, right? This is what you should think. But only the Holy Spirit's revelation of God's word to you personally will teach you how to think. And we find this in 1 John chapter 2, 27. He is the one who teaches you. But the anointing which you have received from Him, that's the Holy Spirit, abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. 
But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it is taught you, you will abide in Him. 1 John 2, 27. Well, as you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you, then you abide with the one who is abiding in you. That is, you start to live according to His teaching. He is in you. You are in Him. John 14, 26. But the Helper, this is Jesus speaking to His disciples, say, hey, I'm going to the cross, but here's what's coming. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now, as the Spirit-filled and Bible-pursuant Christian, Christians that read the Bible, filled with the Holy Spirit, as we go through life, then we become equipped for every situation. And that is because we develop a Holy Spirit-led biblical foundation filter. He said, what? (laughs) That's right. It is a Holy Spirit-led, right? Let that sink in. The Holy Spirit has led us to a biblical foundation filter. What does that mean? Well, this is the filter uh, that mature believers can perceive what is happening spiritually. That is, life comes at us, and now we filter that through the Word of the Lord as taught by the Holy Spirit. And then, and then when we can perceive what is happening spiritual in the, uh, spiritually in the moment, and therefore we understand how to respond according to God's Word, as the Holy Spirit would. That's how He is abiding in us, and if we listen to Him as He teaches us the Word, that's how we abide in Him. We now respond biblically as taught by the Holy Spirit, and that should scare the stew out of you. If when you hear the the statistic that only 11% of Americans have ever read the Bible cover to cover. So what is it that they're using to filter this experience of life? And that's why we're in God's Word every day. And so with all of that said, let's read today's chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, of course, beginning in verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1 goes this way. It's a pretty short chapter, but it's got a big impact. He said, Now concerning the things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. So, let's break it down. The things offered to idols. The church in Corinth was born out of a synagogue. But as mentioned earlier, they began to take on more and more Gentile believers. So, the clash of cultures looked like this. On one hand, you have Jewish believers uh, who were having to learn the Bible so that they could distinguish between biblical and non-biblical rabbinical traditions which they had grown up. They were taught within the religious Jewish culture that they grew up in. So there's one set of people now following Jesus, and they're having to rethink the Bible, okay? Because it's been hammered into their heads their whole lives that the Bible says this, and now Paul and others, and of course the Holy Spirit, is teaching them uh, to think differently than they had grown up. On the other hand, for the Gentiles, everything was new. They weren't having to correct old ways. That Everything was new. All the way down to the idea of monotheism. That is the idea that there's only one God and that that God is the God of Israel. So the complication that Paul was dealing with as a church leader, right, an apostle, uh, as pretty much every pastor deals with today, is when you combine one group of people, all of whom are in various stages of spiritual cover, recovery from church past. And then you add the factor th- uh, that those church members who are in various stages of spiritual discovery were formerly members of two completely different people groups who previously hated each other. So when Paul mentions things offered to idols, we typically skip past that. Most of us never have been given over to types of idols that are carved out of stone or shaped out of metal. But what about those former Buddhists in your congregation? Or what about Hindu believers? They've come out of Hinduism and and all of a sudden now they're following Jesus and they may be in your church today. As a matter of fact, I bet they are. And I guarantee that they take notice of that opening line about things offered to idols. Knowledge puffs up. Paul says in the very first 
verse of this chapter. Paul is dealing with a growing group of people, all of whom are at various stages of spiritual discovery and biblical knowledge. And some are leaving the idols of secular Gentile culture. Others are leaving the idols of former religious rules. And now Paul must address the propensity of all men to compare themselves to other men to determine how good they're doing, how smart they are, how spiritual that they are compared to other people. And even though none of the Corinthians were mature in their development, that did not stop them from comparing their progress to the progress of other men. And Paul is pointing out that even knowledge of Scripture can become an idol, and we should be mindful of that ourselves. Look at what he says here. He says, we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. The love of God and the ongoing pursuit of God should lead us to humility and not pride. And humility leads us to service, not demanding that we be served. People who become great in humility become great in serving others. Consider this from Matthew 23, verse verses 11 through 12. But he who is greatest among you, this is the words of Jesus directly, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Serving others is the exact opposite of worldly greatness. In the world, when people become great, well, then they work less and they play more because everyone is serving them. But in the kingdom of God, in God's design, the greater you become, the more lowly you become. Why is that? Because the more that you discover your innate sinful weakness, the more you appreciate all that God has done to save you and all that he is still doing to maintain you. So when we see the Christian greats exalting themselves, just know that their platforms of pride may impress their followers, but it does very little to edify them. Nor does exalting oneself lead your followers, followers to aspire to humility. Why? Because speed of the leader is the speed of the team. So if you're proud, then those who come after you want to imitate your proudness. So it teaches them that if they become great, then they will also rise to a level where everyone serves them too. Very few pastors understand the difference between getting great, which means that you're more of a servant. And the greater that pastors get, oftentimes the diff more difficulty it is to even have a conversation with them or get an appointment with them. And to the point where the whole culture, nobody ever expects to actually know the pastor. They just go down, sit down, listen to what he has to say, get up, walk out. So the puffed up system is more attractive to our flesh. That's why most people will gravitate toward that, because it is more natural and it's easier to retrofit Christianity into the world's system. But there's a catch, and Paul's point is exalting oneself is not Christianity. Only following Christ's example is Christian. Why? Because the idea of a Christian is one who follows Christ. Take up your cross and follow me. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. Let's read this now. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. Consider 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. It says, Love never fails, but whether uh, there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there where are tongues, well, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 9. Or how about Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting these things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize, of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you, 
Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Now, if I compare myself to other people, I can easily become prideful, especially when listening to some preachers misapply the Bible. (laughs) Sometimes I sit in a pew and I hear some pastors say things and I'm like, what? I see what you're saying. And I'm not saying the Bible doesn't say that somewhere else, but uh, I don't, that's not what that passage says. <laughs> but it's easy to be prideful when you're sitting there, right? Judging other men. But every time that I read the Bible, I learn something that I didn't know. The Lord is correcting my theology. Oh, you thought you knew what that passage meant, Steve, and you've been teaching it to other people. Well, let me show you what it really means. Then you got to put your pen down and go, okay, wait a minute. That changes some things. And that's why we read the Bible every day. So if I compare myself to the standard of God's Word and Jesus' example, well, then I know nothing as I should know it. And you say, well, Steve, really, that is that really the truth? Steve, why should I even be listening to you? Well, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul said. Let's keep reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3. He says, but if anyone loves God... He says, if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. What does that mean? Well, I'm a huge Beatles fan. Okay. If you know, if you love God, then you're known by God. This is the idea. So I'm a huge, huge Beatles fan. And if I read, uh, if I, I have read several books about the band. Uh, I saw the documentary that came out recently, Get Back, about their last album and the, and the last uh, performance that they did. Uh, uh, some of those books are out of print today. So, you know, if you didn't read it back then and you didn't have a copy of it today, you're never going to get that information. I know a lot about the Beatles is the point. And being in the music business myself, both in secular and Christian music, I've met a few musicians who actually played with Paul McCartney. Uh, As a matter of fact, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Blair Cunningham, Paul's drummer in the early 90s, was from Memphis. And I've seen Paul McCartney in concert in Memphis. I saw him in Little Rock. And I'd venture that I know more about Paul McCartney than perhaps some of his friends. But if I were to fly to England, right, catch a train to Scotland, and then a cab to Paul's home, when the front door opened, right, I stand there and I'm open, knocking on the door, and I'm face to face with the walrus himself, two things would become abundantly clear. Number one... I don't know Paul personally. And number two, he does not know me. And this is exactly Paul's point. Many people know about Jesus, but few know him. And those who know him in a saving way follow him. What does that mean? It means that they do what Jesus says. They do what he did. Luke chapter 6, verses 46 through 49 says this, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, you see the progress, coming, hearing, and doing, I'll show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So there is a difference between following Jesus and merely following him around. Hearing the gospel and hearing it and then choosing to surrender to it to the point where it affects your life. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will tell, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." Before Paul goes to the deeper exhortation, he reminds the Corinthian congregation that the qualifier of knowing Jesus is that Jesus knows you. The saving relationship is as close as siblings. 
Look at what the Bible also says in John 1, 12. But as many received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. That is how close our relationship with Jesus should be that we would have a sibling relationship, both of us, knowing the Father and, and, and live according to the word of the Lord. We continue reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. He says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no God but one. An idol is nothing in the world. First off, we know means that not everyone in the church knows. That is, the emphasis is on we know. What does that mean? We. We who know Jesus and we whom Jesus knows, we know that idols are nothing. Not everyone in the church has that understanding, at least not yet. So we have insider information. Yeah, it's available to anyone, but most people don't avail themselves to that information. But this is insider information that all outsiders are intended to eventually know. So that's number one. Secondly, not just we know, but we know. And that means that we know for certain. And that is because the Bible is the ultimate authority. And it says that there is only one God. Consider Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 7. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all things. What about Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 6? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commands." Let's continue reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5. Verse 5, he says, For even if there are so-called gods, not saying that there are, he's just saying, okay, hypothetically, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and lords, we better break that down. Paul is not saying that there's other deities. There's only one God. But what Paul is saying is that there are so-called deities, fake gods, and yet, even though they're fake and don't really exist, people worship them as if they are real. And the fact that people ascribe to worship and power, that is, they ascribe worship and power to fake gods, does not make the fake gods real. It does make the people who worship fake gods a serious potential threat, chiefly because the origin of all fake religion is satanic. So the same is true with government. God created the institution of government. Consider Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror of good works, but evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority, will do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. What do you mean? Because God said to do it. Just because God establishes government, though, does not mean that most governments are run by godly people or that they put forth godly policies. And yet God commands that we submit to the government. You see, the problems with government are not the idea of government. It is that governments are so often run by ungodly men. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. 
Well, let's begin in verse 5 and let's ramp into it. He says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, verse 6, yet there is one God for us, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, uh, that is, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So, for us, he says in verse 6, there's one God and a Father. Paul is not making uh, the point that Christians have their own God, but other believers are, but non believers have their own gods, as if all roads lead to the same heaven. Paul is saying that there are many authorities and there's many false religions, and while they are allowed for a season to exist, everything is ultimately subject to God and will be judged by the Lord. Now, when he says there's one God of whom are all things, and we are for him, and there's one Messiah, Jesus, through whom are all things and through whom we live, he's speaking about the deity of the Messiah. Okay, There's one God, and, 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 and we're subject to him. There's one Messiah, and everything was made through him. Now, let's consider John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him nothing was made that was made, and him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, 1 through 4. And then we hop down to John 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Let's continue reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. Verse 7, he says, However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some, with consciousness of the idol until now, eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Paul is indicating that those who are less knowledgeable, they are believers, and yet they're not knowledgeable in the Word to the point where they're acting as mature believers. So those who are less knowledgeable of the Word about the freedom that they have in Christ are still hesitant to live within their freedom. And that means that Jewish believers were prohibiting themselves from eating meat sacrificed to idols because it was not kosher. And the Gentiles were not eating things sacrificed to idols because they had a very vivid memory that that's one of the ways that they used to worship idols. Now, the apostle Peter had the same issue, Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 19. And when Jesus had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning this parable which he had given. And so he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminating, uh, is eliminated, thus purifying all foods? So they came to Jesus, and they asked him about a parable that he had taught, and obviously it dealt with food. And he said, yeah, it's not what comes into a man. It's not the food that defiles you. What comes into your uh, into your your body just is eliminated through your body. What defiles a person is the things that come from the heart and come out of the mouth, meaning the uh, rabbinic traditions, which were not uh, working uh, in alongside the Word, but rather they were working in opposition to the Word of God. Now consider Acts chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. He said, A voice came to him, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Acts chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. Now, it could also mean that Gentile believers still had that superstition about the power that idols imparted to the meat when they were using it to sacrifice to pagan gods. Or perhaps it meant that factions of both Jews and Gentiles within the church had separate rationalities which led them both to the same uh, uh, lack of freedom. Either way, Paul continues here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8. 
he says this, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we worse. There are typically two extremes in the church, the don'ts and the do's. The don'ts and the do's. You probably go to a don't church or you go to a do church. And the don't church says that the do church, well, they're heretics. And the do church says that the don't church, oh, they're Pharisees. (laughs) The don'ts say that you are commended to God. God loves you better if you don't partake in certain foods or drink certain things or behave in a certain way. The do churches say that you are commended to God if you do partake in those things. And they are different sides of the same coin of religious pride. Either way, you can't win. Matthew chapter 11, 18 and 19 says this, For John came neither eating or drinking. This is Jesus talking. And they say he has a demon, right? He came from a don't church. The son of man came eating and drinking, right? He's a do guy. And they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. What does that mean? Well, the downline of what I am doing, freedom in Christ, and yet there is accountability to God's word. See, he was perfectly balanced. Jesus is not saying, yeah, I was a drunkard. I'm going to tell you, I, I lift my hand up. That was me, right? I'm a glutton. No, he wasn't saying that. He's saying that's what people called him because he lived in the freedom of the word of the Lord. And of course, uh, Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, right? We don't commend ourselves by the things that we do to the Lord. And we don't commend ourselves to the Lord by the things that we don't do, right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Let's keep reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. He says, but beware, lest some of this liberty of yours, because you do have the liberty, become a stumbling block to those who are weak. Remember, we began by talking about how the greatest among you will be the servant. Not the greatest among you will be served. He says, beware that this liberty becomes a stumbling block for those who are weak. You see, those who are weaker in the faith are described as those who do not allow liberty. Now, if you go to a don't church, they would say those who are stronger in the church, those who are stronger in the faith are those who who don't allow liberties. But that's not what Paul's saying. Those who are weaker in the faith are those who do not allow liberty. And in many churches, it's preached the other way around, that the stronger are those who abstain. And perhaps it's because it's easier to teach abstinence than it is to teach moderation. It's easier to say never than to say sometimes or use the Holy Spirit's judgment as to when. It's hard because you can't manage that. You can manage yes and you can manage no, but you can't manage learn how to perceive and understand by the Holy Spirit as He teaches you the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10 continues, For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, Will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? There's some people I know who are big drinkers. They Everywhere they go, ah, we have the liberty to drink whatever we want, whenever we want. And they tell other people, hey, you go to that church. No, come over here. Let's go over here. We're going you know, to drink this or that. And what they do is they take a person who perhaps even had struggled with drinking in the past, or perhaps they're presently an alcoholic. And now all of a sudden, in your pride, you thrust your liberty onto somebody else. And then now it causes them to stumble. So, so while one believer may be weaker with respect to liberty, there is a danger of the one who has knowledge of liberty to abuse that knowledge and thus exposing their own weakness. What is the weakness? Well, you're not immature. I mean, you're not mature. You have a weakness with respect to immaturity. So, so you might have knowledge of liberty, but do you know how to use it? All right, I could have knowledge of firearms, but if I walk around brandishing a firearm in the grocery store, there's a high probability that I'm going to shoot somebody when I get careless with liberty. And they can cause great harm to weak believers by ushering them into the experience of liberty, which the Holy Spirit has held them back from until they're mature enough to partake. 
And guess what? Sometimes you maybe never partake. Or perhaps, right, forever. Case in point, alcoholics. So if you have a liberty to drink alcohol, and I don't think that you can make a case that the Bible says that, that, that uh, you know, you should forever abstain, but, but if you feel like you have a liberty to do that, but then you start to try to thrust that liberty in pride onto somebody else whom the Holy Spirit has said you should never partake in that, well, now you've caused them to sin. You have to be responsible with freedoms. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11, he says, And because of your knowledge shall not the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died? Verse 12, And when you thus sin against the brothers and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Consider Matthew chapter 18, verses 5 through 8. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of those little ones who believe in me to sin, well, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, well, cut it off and cast it from you. If it is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands and two feet and be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 18, verses 5 through 10. Let's continue reading here the last verse. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, then I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Consider this from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, right? If you're a follower of Jesus, then you should have the mind of Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. As a member of the Trinity, the Father and the Holy Spirit are equal partners with God the Father, the Messiah and the Holy Spirit, equal Father, uh, equal parts with the Father. He says, verse 7 of Philippians chapter 2, but he made himself of no reputation. Now, I wouldn't be robbing God to say that I'm equal with the Holy Spirit. I'm equal with God the Father, but I am submitting taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the parents as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that a name at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, guys, believers have a choice. And non-believers also have a choice. Believers have a choice. I can either live according to the Word. Well, you're never going to live according to a Word you've never read. Let's just start with that. I can either live according to the Word or I could not. And non-believers have a choice. I can either surrender to the Gospel or not. And the gospel is very simple. We are sinners, and we are in the crosshairs of the judgment of God. You might not know that. You're probably even struggling to believe that. Really? I'm in the crosshairs of the judgment of God. I'm not that bad compared to, you know, other people that I know. Well, guess what? The comparison is not between us and other people. The comparison is between us and the standard of the Lord, and we all fall short of it. But Jesus saw this from the foundation of the world, and he set himself apart that at the time which was appointed, that he would pay the penalty for our sin so that we could have life. And he has risen from the grave, proving that he has conquered death and he has conquered sin. And he's alive today, saying, if you would turn from your sin and turn to me and surrender to me, you will be saved. And not only that, I'll fill you with my Holy Spirit living inside of you, and he will teach you the word of the Lord so that you will grow more and more mature in your walk with me. And 
that's all offered to you today. It, it was planned from the foundation of the world. It was purchased by Jesus on the cross, packaged in the gospel that if you would turn from your sin and, uh, and surrender to him, you would receive it. And it's presented to you even now. But just like any other present, it's not yours until you take possession. Would you do that today? Would you choose the one who has chosen to save you? I can lead you in a prayer where you can speak directly with him and you can surrender to him now. And you can truly start living today. Let's pray. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I know that you're holy and perfect and I fall short of your standard. I believe that you will someday judge the world in righteousness. But I believe Jesus died on the cross. And by giving his life, he paid the penalty for my sin. I believe that he has risen from the grave. He has conquered sin and death. And I believe he is alive right now, offering to me salvation forever kept in his hand if I would turn from my sin and surrender to him. Lord, I'm turning from my sin now. I don't want to be who I have been. I want to be who you have designed for me to be. I surrender control of my life to you now. Lord, come into my life now. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and began to teach me how to live a life that honors and pleases you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I pray. If you pray that prayer and you meant it, welcome to the forever family of God. But we would love to hear from you. And you can send a message to us at groundworksministries.com. That's groundworksministries.com. And there's an info section and say, Steve, I prayed with you. Where do I go from here? What do I do next? For the rest of you guys, I love y'all. And uh, we're just reading a chapter a day. So tomorrow, chapter nine. I'm Steve Wiggins, and this is the Groundworks Ministries podcast. Check us out at groundworksministries.com. Groundworks Ministries.